section number thirty eight of the mary francis story book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the mary francis story book by jane eyre fryer chirp the third john listens to the cricket the dutch clock in the corner struck ten when the carrier sat down at his fireside so troubled was he that he scarcely heard the cuckoo as it counted off the strokes he could scarcely believe what his eyes had seen in the ware-room of gruff and tackleton if any one had told him he would not have believed his dot could be a party to such dreadful deceit yet in his own heart he did not blame her but rather the old young man who had been so wickedly unfair and he was planning to do him harm to pay him back he hoped that dot would be able to explain but no there really wasn't any hope of that there she was coming she had been upstairs with the baby putting it to bed as he sat brooding near the hearth she came close to him and put her little stool at his feet he then felt her hand upon his own and knew she was looking up in his face he glanced at her she looked as sweet as ever until she caught the expression on his face at first she seemed surprised then her surprise changed in a wild recognition of his thoughts and she simply bent her head and clasped her hands but no words were said at length she rose and went away and he felt glad for the first time since he had known her to have her gone there was a gun hanging on the wall he took it down and moved towards the stranger's room he put his hand to the door when suddenly the struggling fire burst into a glow of light and the cricket on the hearth began to chirp no sound he could have heard no human voice not even hers could so have moved and softened him the very words in which she had told him of her love for this same cricket were as if just spoken in her sweet pleasant voice making household music and they thrilled through and through his better nature and awoke it into life and action he moved from the door like a man who had been walking in his sleep when awakening from a frightful dream he put the gun aside clasping his hands before his face he sat down again beside the fire the cricket on the hearth came out into the room and stood in fairy shape before him i love it said the fairy voice for the many times i have heard it and the many thoughts its harmless music has given me she said so cried the carrier true this has been a happy home john and i love the cricket for its sake she's so sweet-tempered so cheerful busy light-hearted otherwise i never could have loved her as i did the voice correcting him said do you should trust her the fairy voice said all night long he listened to the voice all night long the household fairies were busy with him showing him how sweet and dear she was how he had never found her untrue or had reason to doubt her except this once he rose up when it was broad day and washed and tidied himself he could not go on his usual rounds for it was tackleton's wedding day he had planned to go merrily to the church with dot but such plans were at an end ah what a different wedding anniversary he had expected john blames himself the carrier had thought that tackleton would pay him an early visit and he was right he had just finished brushing his hair when he saw the merchant in his carriage coming along the road as the carriage drew nearer 
he saw that tackleton was dressed out sprucely for marriage and that he had decorated his horse's head with flowers and favors the horse looked much more like a bridegroom than tackleton whose half-closed eye was more disagreeably expressive than ever but the carrier took little heed of this his thoughts were elsewhere john peerybingle said tackleton my good fellow how do you find yourself this morning i have had but a poor night mr tackleton said the carrier shaking his head for i have been a good deal disturbed in my mind but it is over now can you spare me half an hour or so for some private talk i come on purpose returned tackleton lightly never mind the horse he'll stand quiet enough if you'll give him a mouthful of hay you are not to be married before noon i think said john no answered tackleton plenty of time plenty of time when they entered the kitchen tilly slowboy was knocking at the stranger's door one of her very red eyes was at the keyhole for she had been crying because her mistress cried she was knocking very loud and seemed frightened if you please i can't make nobody here said tilly looking round i hope nobody ain't gone and been and died if you please this hope miss slowbody made more emphatic by kicking on the door but it led to no result shall i help asked tackleton turning to john the carrier nodded his head so tackleton went to the door and he too kicked and knocked and he too failed to get any reply but he thought of trying the handle of the door and as it opened easily he peeped in went in and soon came running out again he's gone said tackleton and the window's open i don't see any marks to be sure or signs of a fight but i thought perhaps you might have been so angry he nearly shut up the expressive eye altogether he looked at john so hard and he gave his eye and his face and his whole body a sharp twist as if he would have screwed the truth out of john make yourself easy said the carrier he went into that room last night without harm in word or act from me and no one has entered it since he has gone away of his own free will oh well i think he has got off pretty easy said tackleton taking a chair the sneer was lost upon the carrier who sat down too and shaded his face in his hand for some time before speaking you showed me last night he said at length my wife my dear wife that i love deceiving me and meeting a strange man who had deceived me i think there's no man in the world i wouldn't rather have had show it to me i confess i know that i am not a favorite in your home john because i never believed wholly in your pretty little wife said tackleton and as you did show me and as you saw her to such disadvantage it is right you should know what my mind is on the subject for it is settled and nothing can change it tackleton muttered a few words about it being necessary to decide but he was overawed by the manner of his companion plain and unpolished as it was there was something noble and dignified about it i am a plain rough man continued the carrier with very little to recommend me i am not a clever man as you very well know i am not a young man i love my little dot because i had seen her grow up from a child in her father's house because i knew how precious she was because she had been in my life for years and years he paused a moment then went on i often thought that though i wasn't good enough for her i should make her a kind husband and perhaps appreciate her better than another and so it came about we were married ha 
said Tackleton, with a shake of his head. I knew how much I loved her and how happy I should be, continued the carrier, but I had not sufficiently considered her. No, said Tackleton. No, you didn't stop to think how giddy, frivolous, frickle, vain, ha! Huh? You'd better not interrupt me, said the carrier, with some sternness, till you understand me, which you seem far from doing. The toy merchant looked at him in surprise. I didn't consider that I took her, at her age, with her beauty, away from her young companions and their many scenes of pleasure, into my dull house and my tedious society. I didn't consider how little suited I was to her fun and humor, and how wearisome I must be to one of her quick spirit. No, I took advantage of her hopeful nature, and I married her. I shouldn't have done so. The toy merchant gazed at him without winking. Even the half-shut eye was now open. Heaven bless her, said the carrier, for the cheerful way she has tried not to let me see how it was. Heaven help me that, in my slow mind, I have not found it out before. Poor child, poor Dot, strange I did not realize when I have seen her eyes fill with tears on hearing of such a marriage as our own spoken of. How good and kind she has been. The thought will comfort me when I am here alone. Here alone, said Tackleton. Then you do mean to take some notice of her deceit? I mean, answered the carrier, to do her the greatest kindness in my power, to try to make it all up to her. She shall be free to go where she will. Make it up to her? exclaimed Tackleton twisting and turning his great ears with his hands. I must have heard wrong. You didn't say that, of course. Didn't I speak plainly, said the carrier, giving the toy merchant a shake? Very plainly indeed, answered Tackleton. As if I meant it? Very much as if you meant it. Anger and distrust have left me, said the carrier, and nothing but my grief remains. In an unhappy moment some old lover, better suited to her years than I, returned. Last night she saw him in the interview we witnessed. It was wrong, but otherwise than this she is innocent if there is truth on earth. I should not have taken her from her home. She shall return to it, and I will trouble her no more. Her father and mother will be here today and they shall take her home. This is the end of what you showed me. Now it's over. Oh, no, John, not over. Do not say it's over yet. Not quite yet. I heard your noble words. I could not steal out again, letting you think me ignorant of what you said. Do not say it's over till the clock has struck again. Dot had entered quietly while John and Tackleton were talking, and had heard every word. No hand can make the clock which will strike again for me the hours that are gone, replied the carrier with a faint smile. But let it be so, if you will, my dear. Well, muttered Tackleton, I must be off, for when it strikes again, I must be on my way to church. Goodbye, John Perry Bingle. The carrier saw him to the door, watched his horse until it disappeared in the distance, and then went out himself. His little wife, being left alone, sobbed piteously, but often dried her tears to say how good and dear he was, and once or twice she laughed through her tears so heartily and triumphantly that Tilly was quite horrified. Ow, if you please don't, said Tilly, it's enough to dead and bury the baby, so it is, if you please. Will you bring him to see me sometimes, inquired her mistress, when I don't live here and have gone to my old home? Oh, if you please don't, cried Tilly, throwing back her head. 
she looked a great deal like boxer when he howled ow if you please don't what has everybody gone and been and done with everybody making everybody so miserable ow caleb confesses his deceit and she might have kept on if just at that moment caleb plummer had not come in leading his daughter why mary which was dot's other name you remember why mary said bertha not at the wedding i told her you would not be there mum whispered caleb i heard as much last night but bless you said the little man i don't care what they say i don't believe them there ain't much of me but what little there is would be torn to pieces sooner than i'd believe a word against you he put his arms around her neck and hugged her very much as a child might have hugged one of the dolls he had made bertha wanted to come see you instead of going to the wedding said caleb so we started in good time i often wish i had not deceived her in regard to tackleton and i've come to the conclusion that i'd better tell her the truth you'll stay with us while i tell her won't you mum he inquired trembling from head to foot i don't know what effect it may have upon her i don't know what she'll think of me i don't know that she'll ever care for her father afterwards but it's best she be undeceived and i must bear the consequences as i deserve mary said bertha where is your hand i heard them speaking softly last night of some blame against you they were wrong i told them so i scorned to hear a word i know and trust you mary so well that could my sight be restored at this instant i could choose you from a crowd my sister her father went on one side of her while dot remained on the other holding her hand bertha my dear said caleb i have something on my mind i wish to tell you while we three are alone listen kindly i have a confession to make to you a confession father yes my child i have wandered from the truth said caleb with a pitiable expression in his face i have wandered from the truth intending to be kind to you and have been cruel she turned toward him and repeated the word cruel he accuses himself too strongly bertha said dot you'll say so presently you'll be the first to tell him so he cruel to me cried bertha with an unbelieving smile not meaning to be my child said caleb but i have been although i never knew it until yesterday my dear blind daughter forgive me the world dear heart is not as you imagine it it is not as i have represented it the eyes you have trusted in have been false to you she turned her wondering face towards him still but drew back and clung closer to her friend your road in life was rough my poor one said caleb and i meant to smooth it for you i have pictured things to you as different from what they are i have even changed the characters of some people to make you happier i have surrounded you with fancies but living people are not fancies she said turning very pale you can't change them i have done so bertha caleb told her there is one person you know oh father why do you say i know she said i who am so miserably blind she stretched out her hands as if to feel her way the marriage that takes place today caleb continued is with a stern sword grinding man he has been a hard master to you and me my dear for many years ugly in his looks and in his nature cold and callous always unlike what i have painted him to you in everything my child in everything 
oh why cried the blind girl why did you ever do this teach me to love a person who really never existed it is like death her poor father hung his head and offered no reply in his penance and sorrow suddenly the cricket on the hearth unheard by all but her began to chirp not merrily but so mournfully that her tears began to flow and when the fairy spirit which had been near the carrier all night appeared behind her pointing toward her father she turned to dot mary she said tell me what my home is like what it is truly it is a poor place bertha very poor and bare indeed the house will scarcely keep out the wind and rain another winter it is as roughly shielded from the weather bertha dot continued in a low voice as your poor father in a sackcloth coat the blind girl greatly agitated rose and led the carrier's wife a little aside those presents that i treasured so much they came almost at my wish she said trembling where did they come from did you send them no who then dot saw she knew already and was silent the blind girl spread her hands before her face again but in quite a different manner now dear mary a moment please speak softly tell me truly look across the room to where we were sitting just now to where my father is my father so kind and loving to me and tell me what you see i see said dot who understood her well an old man sitting in a chair and leaning over sorrowfully with his head resting in his hands he looks as if his child could comfort him bertha yes yes she will go on he is an old man worn with care and work he is a sad thoughtful gray-haired man who seems to have lost the object he most loved in the world his child for whom he lived the blind girl broke away from her and dropping on her knees before him threw her arms around his neck oh my father my dear dear father she cried i have been so blind but now my eyes are open i never knew you to think i might have died and never known the father who has been so loving to me caleb managed to say my bertha and in my blindness i believed him to be so different said the girl still caressing him so young and gay the fresh smart father in the blue coat said poor caleb he's gone nothing is gone she answered dearest father no everything is here in you but father she hesitated mary mary is just what you told me there is no change in her you never told me anything of her that was not true i should have done so i'm afraid said caleb if i could have made her better than she was but i must have changed her for the worst if i had changed her at all nothing could improve her bertha the blind girl was delighted with this reply even though she had felt so sure of what it must be and her renewed embrace of dot was charming to behold the dead returns to life dot glanced at the clock and saw that it was within a few minutes of striking and immediately became very excited more changes than you think for may happen though said dot changes for the better i mean changes for great joy to some of us you mustn't let them startle you too much when they come but listen you've a quick ear bertha do you hear wheels upon the road yes coming very fast i i i know you have a quick ear said dot holding her hand to her heart and talking as fast as she could because i have often noticed it and because you were so quick to hear that strange step last night 
though why you should have taken such a quick notice of it and said whose step is that seems strange but as i said just now there are great changes in this world great changes and we can't do better than prepare ourselves to be surprised at hardly anything caleb wondered what she meant for he saw that she was speaking to him as much as to his daughter he saw with astonishment that she was fluttered and distressed and could scarcely breathe as she held to a chair to save herself from falling they are wheels indeed she panted coming nearer nearer very close and now you hear them stopping at the garden gate and now you hear a step outside the door the same step bertha is it not and now she uttered a cry of delight and running up to caleb put her hands over his eyes as a young man rushed into the room and flinging his hat into the air came sweeping down upon them is it over cried dot yes happily over yes do you know the voice dear caleb did you ever hear one like it before cried dot if my boy who went to south america had not died if he were alive said caleb trembling he is alive shrieked dot taking her hands from his eyes and clapping them in ecstasy look at him see here he stands before you healthy and strong your own dear son your own dear living brother bertha she turned to meet the sunburned sailor halfway and let him kiss her heartily just at this moment the carrier entered upon seeing them thus he started back look john cried caleb look here my own son him that you fitted out and sent away yourself him you always such a friend to the carrier advanced to seize him by the hand but stepped back as he noticed his resemblance to the deaf man in the cart edward was it you now tell him all cried dot tell him all edward and don't spare me i was the man said edward and you stole disguised into the home of your old friend the carrier said i would never have believed it of you there was a true and frank boy once how many years is it caleb since we heard that he was dead and had proved we thought he would never have done that there was a generous friend of mine once a friend who was more a father than a friend he never would have judged a man before he heard his case you were he so i am certain you will hear me now the carrier with a troubled glance at dot replied well that's but fair i will you must know then that when i left here a boy i was in love and my love was returned but the girl was very young and couldn't quite make up her mind still i felt quite certain that she loved me as dearly as i loved her you did exclaimed the carrier yes and now i am sure she did so all through the hardships and perils of my years away i was constantly thinking of when i should come back to her when i landed twenty miles from here i heard she had bestowed herself upon another and a richer man i did not wish to find fault with her if she had preferred him what i wanted to find out was whether she had done this of her own free will i wanted to judge for myself just how she felt so i disguised myself you know how and waited on the road you know where you had no suspicion of me neither had she pointing to dot until i whispered in her ear at the fireside and so startled her that she nearly betrayed me oh dot exclaimed the carrier but when she knew that edward was alive and had come back 
sobbed Dot, now speaking for herself, as she had long wished to do, and when he told her why he had disguised himself, she advised him to keep his secret close, by all means, for she knew that his old friend John Peerybingle was too open in nature to keep such a secret, no matter how he tried. Then she, that's me, John, told him all, how his sweetheart had thought him dead, and how she had, after all the years, been over-persuaded by her mother, because the silly dear old thing called the marriage advantageous, and when she, that's me, John, told him they were not yet married, but soon would be, and that it would be nothing but a sacrifice if it went on, for there was no love on her side, and when he went nearly wild with joy to hear it, when she, that's me again, John, said she would help him and carry messages to his sweetheart, as she had so often done as a girl, and she would find out what his sweetheart thought was right. Oh, said John, and it was right, John, Dot continued, catching her breath, for they were married, John, an hour ago, and here's the bride, and Gruff and Tackleton may die a bachelor, and I'm a happy little woman. May God bless you. As she drew May forward and lavished all kinds of good wishes and congratulations upon her, the carrier stood confounded. As he flew towards her, Dot stretched out her hand to stop him. John, dear John, forgive me. It was wrong to have a secret from you. I am very sorry. I didn't think it any harm until the night when I came and sat down by you on the little stool. But when I looked at your face, I knew you must have seen me walking in the ware-room with Edward, and were suspicious of me. But, oh, John, how could, how could you think wrong of me? John Perry Bingle would have caught her in his arms, but no, she wouldn't let him. Wait a minute, please, John dear, until you let me hear you tell me that you believe me and trust me and that you know how much I love you, so much that I'll never have another secret from you and that you'll never, never think of sending me from my home and yours, John, and our cricket on the hearth. Then you would have been delighted to see Dot run into the carrier's arms. You may be sure the carrier was in a state of perfect rapture, and you may be sure that everybody, especially Miss Slowboy, wept for joy, and she, wishing to include the baby, handed him around to everyone in succession, as if he were something to eat or drink. But now the sound of wheels was heard again outside the door, and somebody exclaimed that Gruff and Tackleton was coming back in. Soon he appeared, looking warm and flustered. My, what in nation's this, John Peering Bingle, said Tackleton. There's some mistake. I had an appointment with Miss Fielding to meet me at the church, and, oh, here she is, seeing her with Edward, to whom he then turned, saying, I beg your pardon, sir, I haven't the pleasure of knowing you, but if you can do me the favor to spare this young lady, she has a rather particular engagement with me this morning. But I can't spare her, said Edward. I couldn't think of it. What do you mean, you vagabond? exclaimed Tapleton. I mean, and pardon you for being vexed, I mean that I am as deaf as your harsh words as I was last night such a startled look as Tackleton gave him. It is too bad, sir, said Edward, holding out May's left hand, especially the third finger, that the young lady can't accompany you to the church. But as she has been there once this morning, perhaps you'll excuse her. Tackleton looked hard at the third finger and took a ring out of his waistcoat pocket. 
Miss Slowboy, said Tackleton, will you have the kindness to throw that into the fire? Thank you. It was a previous engagement, quite an old engagement, that prevented my wife from keeping her appointment with you, I assure you, said Edward. Mr. Tackleton will do me the justice to say that I told him about this old engagement many times, and that I never could forget it said may blushing oh certainly said tackleton oh to be sure oh it's all right it's quite correct you are now mrs edward plummer i infer that's the name said the bridegroom ah i shouldn't have known you said tackleton i give you joy sir with these words he hurried away merely stopping at the gate to take the flowers and favors off the horse's head and to kick the horse once just to relieve his feelings of course the next thing in order was the wedding feast and dot set to work with all her might even calling in some neighborly help and everybody as if on the point of life or death ran against each other in all the doorways and round all the corners tumbling over tilly slowboy and the baby everywhere then there was an expedition to find mrs fielding and to apologize to her and to bring her back happy and forgiving at first she would not listen at all and wouldn't say anything but now carry me to my grave which seemed absurd on account of her not being dead or even ill after a while she settled down into a dreadful calm an advantage was taken of this to get her into her coat and gloves and carry her off to john perry bingles when they reached the house there was dot's father and mother and may's mother and dot's mother began to renew their acquaintance after a grand confusion of talk and action they actually were seated at the table to have missed that dinner would have been to have missed as good and as jolly a meal as man need eat after dinner caleb sang his song about the sparkling bowl and you may not believe it but he sang it through and by the by a most unexpected thing occurred just as he finished the last verse tackleton does the unexpected there was a tap at the door, and a man came staggering in with a big round box, which he set on the table in the center of the nuts and apples. He said, Mr. Tackleton's compliments, and as he hasn't got no use for the cake himself, perhaps you'll eat it. And with those words, he walked off. There was some surprise among the company, as you may imagine mrs fielding suggested that the cake might be poison and told about a cake which she had heard of that had turned a seminary of young ladies blue but notwithstanding the story the cake was cut by may with much ceremony and rejoicing i don't think any one had tasted it when there came another tap at the door and the same man appeared again having under his arm a big brown paper parcel mr tackleton's compliments and he sent a few toys for the baby they ain't ugly the whole party would not have been able to find words to express their astonishment even if they had had plenty of time but they had none for the messenger had scarcely shut the door when there came another tap and tackleton himself walked in mrs perrybingle said the toy merchant hat in hand i'm sorry i'm sour by disposition but i am going to try to do better caleb i might have had you and your daughter for dear friends as it is my house is lonely to-night i have not even a cricket on the hearth i have scared them all away be kind to me please let me join this happy party he was at home in five minutes you never saw such a fellow 
what had he been doing with himself all his life never to have known before how much fun he had in him or what had the fairies been doing with him to change him so there was but one more living creature wanted to make the party complete and in the twinkling of an eye there he was very thirsty with hard running for boxer had gone all the way with the cart on its journey and being disgusted at finding his master absent and unable to induce the horse to come with him had turned tail and trotted home there was a dance in the evening but since the old people didn't dance and dot said her dancing days were over because i believe she preferred to sit near the carrier really edward and may were the only dancers and they got up amid great applause to dance alone while bertha played her liveliest tune well if you'll believe me they had not been dancing five minutes when the carrier suddenly jumps up takes dot round the waist dashes out into the room and starts off with her toe and heel quite wonderfully tackleton no sooner sees this than he skims across to mrs fielding and follows suit then Dot's father and mother and Caleb and Tilly Slowboy join in. Hark! How the cricket joins the music with its chirp, 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 and how the kettle hums. End of section 38. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 39 of the Mary Frances Storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jennifer dalman the mary frances storybook by jane eyre fryer the return home goodbye mary frances come again in the middle of the story the cricket on the hearth when everybody was so anxious to hear more there came a sound of many voices and then a loud scream mary frances knew that it was the voice of the old witch who had been listening let me be she was crying i don't want to go away i want to find out who the old man was i want to find out who the old man was i want to see if tackleton did marry may fielding i won't go so there did i tramp all the miles to get here just to be taken back again then came the deep heavy voice of the giant be quiet it said be quiet no you won't have to go back we'll take you this time we'll lock you up so tight you'll stay where you're put and you'll come when you're bid that's what you'll do S somebody tell me quick screamed the old witch quick did may fielding mary tackleton did she did she and mary frances heard her screaming did she did she until her voice died away how mary frances longed to tell her no but she did not dare she deserves her punishment the queen whispered and since she knew that this was true mary frances did not speak after the story was over she received her copy from the ready writer and slipped it into her story satchel with the rest of the stories then she wandered down by the seashore alone near the shore there was a boy with a feather in his cap sitting on a rock she knew him in a minute where did the giant take the old witch do you think peter pan she asked to the devil's den said peter i saw them go to the devil's den cried mary frances how dreadful it's not such a bad place said peter it's just a deep cave it is lighted from a large opening in the top its name is the worst thing about it but the old witch cannot get out of it if they lock her in oh she got away from the giant's basket then she did she was so crazy to hear a story through that she watched her first chance to make off when the giant guard was asleep what about the pirate asked mary frances he is chained to a rock in the pirate's cove and he spends his time jumping in and out of the water he has jumped so much and so hard that the suds are rising all around him just as when you blow bubbles in a bowl holding the pipe down in the water poor thing 
some day the suds will rise so high that the bubbles will cover him and smother him is there no way for him to save himself asked mary frances certainly said peter pan all he has to do is be good but he won't be he's just naturally wicked he'd murder fairies if he could and he'd steal all the stories in the world and he'd feed the children on charcoal and castor oil he told me so once it was after i caught him trying to steal my shadow he must have a wicked heart said mary frances once i asked him why he was so bad peter told her and what do you think he said i don't know i'm sure she returned he said it was because his mother never kissed him his mother never kissed him exclaimed mary frances why what a queer kind of mother now my mother suddenly she felt very homesick tears sprang to her eyes why peter she cried wistfully why peter it must be over a year since my mother kissed me shall i turn wicked too oh i wish i could see her my own dear mother as she finished speaking a beautiful little sailboat appeared before them it was smaller than the good fairy step aboard then said peter pan rising and leading her toward the boat this is a fairy boat you will be home in an hour sit in the stern take the tiller in your hand hold it steady and wish out loud where you want to go and he helped mary frances on to the boat oh but i haven't thanked the story people for my wonderful wonderful time she exclaimed i wish i could thank them even as she spoke every door and window of the castle opened and the story people appeared thank you all thank you for ever and ever thank you for all the girls and boys in the world cried mary frances have you your stories called the story king yes i have them here said mary frances holding up her story satchel when you want more come again dear child called the story queen oh yes come again called all the story people for we love you the story people love all children take our love to all you can and good-bye 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 dear dear friends called mary frances as the little boat sailed away good-bye and thank you she watched until the island was too far away for her to make out the forms of the people at the castle windows then she wished aloud home take me to my mother and father and my brother little fairy sailboat and the wind blew and filled the sails and the sun warmed and cheered her and the waves danced about the boat making little lapping sounds which were like music and the next thing she knew she was running up the garden walk into her mother's open arms the stories are not yours dear they belong to all children said her mother when mary frances emptied her story satchel and told her of her wonderful adventures among the story people let us make enough copies for them all and so they wrote this book end of section thirty nine end of the mary frances story book by jane eyre fryer